Okay, welcome. This is um, kind of introduction video to thinking about what immersive research is. Um, and thinking through some ideas that are kind of at the basis of doing immersive, immersive research, some of the problems that people come across, some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses. What I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go over some of the web pages, some of the resources are on the web page, and I'm going to think through a bunch of ideas that take us from what immersive might look like, immersive research might look like, into some of the ideas about where its strengths and weaknesses are, and then how we might manage and mitigate some of those issues before concluding with just a quick look over some books that I'm using at the moment, um, which um, if people are interested in taking this further, they can go and start reading around some of the, the basic issues in a little bit more detail. Because um, one of the things you can't do with this sort of thing is give a clear 10-step guide or something about how to go about doing it. What you really need is a kind of good basic uh, understanding, and then you need to throw yourself in and start doing so. So that's where that kind of early understanding has to come from the research. So I'll end with that. And that's for people who are probably kind of uh, looking at them doing this in an academic study rather than um, if people are looking at this video because they're interested in just understanding a bit about the stuff that I do. So here's the website, um, and this video will be hosted on here somewhere. The two places I just wanted to highlight is the places to get some foundational knowledge that will probably help with this video is, is first of all to go into About. And if we go down through About, it comes to the research philosophy. And if you click through that, um, I have a go there explaining some of my research philosophy, why I do this sort of research. And it gives you, I think, a bit of an understanding as to some of the kind of basics of where, where, I, where I came from in terms of this research, uh, where I came to find it. And then, as a start point, that's quite useful. But as we go a little bit further, uh, the um, research that I've actually published, the papers that I've published about this, actually book chapters. First one there. Um, on not becoming a boxer that's quite a useful one um, how I, I've done boxing literally been a boxer but at the same time I was always a researcher so in that respect in one respect I, I just wasn't a boxer I could always be a little bit different I could always take myself out of the field which a lot of boxers don't have the opportunity to do and then if you click through that was me clicking through into the older one being nosy um, the notion of being nosy trying to find things out understand things um, at the same time play on words a little bit because I had my nose broken a few times while doing boxing. That helps us understand how you can use the body as a, as a tool in research. So a couple of places there to kind of read about some of these ideas that I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, <clears throat> and more broadly, if people are interested in how I do this in terms of a practical sense, have a look at the services. And there's some information here as well to have a look at there. So let's have a think about some of this stuff. What, what is immersive research? Um, quite simply, to be immersed in a space, a social space, a subculture, a community, um, however you want to define that space, to be immersed into it. A nice way to think about this is um, what, why we would do this is to try and understand swimming, to get better at swimming. You've got to go and get in the pool. You've got to go and get wet. Um, so it's, it's a very simple way of actually thinking about re research rather than the way that people tend to think about research in terms of experimentation and um, laboratories and things like that. When we're studying society, to try and take society into a, a laboratory and study it is very difficult. It inherently moves it away from what it already is. Um, so we have to go into society rather than try and bring it into our lab. And then if we go into that small space, um, to try and understand it. The deeper we go into it, the deeper we can get certain types of understanding out of it. If we live superficially within that space, we don't necessarily understand all the detail that's going on there. And I know already that people are listening to this, you can start to understand some of this from your own experiences. Um, if any of you have spent time in your local pub, you know the first few times you went in, you kind of knew where the bar was, you figured that out, and then all the toilets over there, I like that beer. I don't like that beer. And then maybe after three years of going in, you know, the barmaid, the barman, um, the bartenders, the waiting staff, the chap always sits in the corner who stinks of cigars, whatever, and you know their names and you know much more about them. And the longer you're in that space, the more you start to understand it. It's a simple way of trying to understand this sort of stuff. 
one quite one quite useful way of grasping this, I think, is to try and um, use the phrase making the familiar feel sorry, making the strange feel familiar. I can change it a little bit for my students. Uh, say, um, making the weird seem normal. Um, what we're trying to do when we go into some of these spaces <clears throat> um, is to try and go into a space often which seems very very awkward to us, very um, not normal. Um, and we're trying to spend enough time in that space, speaking to people and understanding it so that it starts to become normal. The weirdness starts to drift away and you start to understand things in the way that the people who are in that space understand them. So making the strange feel familiar. <clears throat> But then once, you have to, once you've done that to some degree and you've got some sort of understanding from that and who knows how long that might take, maybe three or four weeks, maybe four or five months. The job of a good scientist is to then do the opposite again, is to make the familiar now feel strange again so that you can see it through a more detached lens. So if you get so used to being in some sort of space that you stop seeing it in that way where initially it was like, oh, that was strange. Why are people doing that? Now it's become so familiar, you take it for granted. You take it as normal. That can be problematic for a kind of a, a more detached scientific analysis. So we have to be able to move between those two positions, the strange and the familiar. And that takes a little bit of practice. That's one of the things that I think is a little bit more challenging is when people get into these spaces, they start to just almost, um, the, 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 the scientific element can start to drift away. Um, people just enjoy the space, enjoy spending time there sometimes, not all the time with this sort of research. One thing that can happen is that people can become very enthralled by the rich and detailed data that they're getting. It certainly happened to me. Um, and that knowledge that you get from the inside, from being in that space, um, you can start to kind of give it a primacy. Another way of thinking about this that I've talked about is um, one of those papers that I mentioned at the beginning, the being a boxer one, is that knowledge can become fetishized. So what does that mean? It's, it's a term which we don't often hear much in society except for in um, uh, in relation to sex communities, um, but it has it has a it has a meaning uh, which would be something along the lines of it's given a, a, a kind of a, a power, maybe a mystical power, which it doesn't necessarily deserve, and that happens a lot with this kind of immersive research from the inside. People are very quick to say, "Oh, well, I, I spent time in that subculture, therefore I know more about it than you." Um, in the uh, being nosy paper i talk about this in relation to there's a there's a machismo attached to this stuff and a lot of the early research full stop was done by men on men and um, a lot of the early research within this sort of area i mean scientific research, research more broadly um, but on a lot of the research within this area specifically was by men going out into the field and trying to kind of track down tribes and go into these obscure places or Later on, it moved from anthropology and sociology started to pick it up and people were going into the kind of rougher parts of, of the cities. Again, all, all men mainly doing this, not all men, but mainly men. And a attaching some sort of, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting into the, the, the dark and dirty depths of society. And that is a part of this process of people attaching meaning to this sort of inner res in, insider research, this immersive close-up research, which doesn't necessarily need to be there. Because as soon as you start to see that people can fetishize that knowledge, can see it as something that's, that has some more power than it should necessarily have, um, you start to see that they may, may be missing some of the problems with their research and problems with taking that insider lens from taking that insider position. So what, what that tends to be is that once we're immersed in a space, well, we always have to remember that we're going to reveal things that people on the outside might not be able to see. I might be able to reveal it to be able to see it better now. At the same time, by revealing one thing, I'm concealing another. And another way of thinking about it, by lighting something up, by putting something into a, a stream of light, I'm, I'm lighting that up, but at the same time, I'm casting something else in shadow. I can't see the thing now that's in shadow. Bringing something into focus. And then at the same time, you're making something else opaque. So this thing is now in focus, but out here and in there is, is, is turned opaque because of that, that focus. So this is some of the kind of problems that we have. And, and one of the examples that I talk about in this in terms of some of my boxing research is that while I spend a lot of time in boxing gyms, um, 
and I've moved around in different places. My first piece of work, I spent a lot of time with one very small group of men, um, about 25 men in a big gym um, with lots of other things that happened in the gym, amongst them bodybuilding. Um, and there were some women in this space, not many, but some. Um, and during that time, because of the men that I was spending time with, there was an assumption within that gym that I was one of those guys, one of those lads, and to a large degree I was. Um, I could certainly carry myself in the way that, that that those lads carried themselves. There was a fundamental difference between me and them. I wasn't as sexist as they were. Well, I wasn't sexist at all. Um, there was homophobia. There was sometimes racism. There was violence and aggression, um, which I could handle myself around. I could understand. I didn't take part in. I'm not that person. But I could be confused as being that person. Because of that, I never really built up relationships with the women in the gym. And that, I mean, to be fair, they weren't the focus of my research. But that, what that does mean is it highlights very clearly that I told a partial story from that gym because of my closeness to one set of people. I completely missed, couldn't grasp, couldn't get into the experiences of another group of people within that space. So my closeness revealed one part of the social life in that space, but also concealed something else. So that's one way of kind of thinking about it. Now, for me, that was acceptable. The work was to try and look at men um doing violence to each other um in a boxing ring ritual ritualistic violence i should say um <clears throat> but in other research projects that's not acceptable it's not acceptable to have just one focus that you need to understand what's going on in the whole space um and, and in that place it'd be far more important to try and manage and mitigate some of these issues that come along through occupying certain spaces and getting close to certain groups one of the ways which I've written about this in terms of um, the first paper I mentioned, uh, not, not becoming a boxer, is the work of, is using the work of Norbert Elias, his discussion of a detour via detachment. Um, the detour denotes part of a journey moving in and out and, and around and the detachment, trying to pull yourself back out again of the space um, or the community or the subculture once you've been inside it. And interesting, we, we, we do that anyway, I think, as human beings. One of the things with qualitative research that I'm talking about here is that it, it's largely our way of understanding the world. While science isn't based on this, a lot of science is built on um, objective attempts at objective, positivistic research. We control a variable, we test it, we, we, we um, do some statistical analysis, and then we can prove point A or point B or disprove point A or point B. And that's not really what we're doing here. And that's not really what we do in daily life. Daily life, when we try and understand something, we might read about it, think about it, ask somebody about it, poke it, <laughs> prod it, lift it up. And in that process, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to get closer to the thing, to understand it. And, okay, I'm not, I literally bring this closer to me to, to try and figure out what it is. But I don't just take it, close to my eye I might move it away again I might hold it in a different way um, I might ask somebody a question about it and that's the way we start to understand things so it's actually quite a, a natural way for human beings to understand the world is through this what lies called a detour by detachment the way I like to think about it, let's, let's 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 do it here if I give you this this this, this packet of chewing gum that I've got um, if I give this to a child to try and figure out you know how is a sweet in there how are you going to get it and they might be able to understand that it's a sweet and then they've got to figure out which the open end is okay it's there and then if you, you have to oh okay something's happened now playing with it and and moving it around and looking at it in different ways and seeing different positions has helped me figure out that something comes out okay now i can figure out that i can eat that if i want but at the same time i might want to just understand it more broadly and i might just want to look at it from a distance I might want to measure it and see the colours. I might want to twist it round. All different positions and different ways of looking at it. So, so one thing that we can try and think about is in terms of the position that you occupy in relation to the thing you're trying to understand. Do I bring it closer? Do I bring it further away? Same with a painting. If you've got a, a painting you want to look at, you can look at it from a kind of a distance and see the kind of broad brush strokes maybe and then you get closer if you just pick one of those positions you don't fully understand the painting you don't understand the detail or the wider picture so you, you move in and out 
this is like shifting positions basically it's very natural within research i think something that people don't necessarily talk about too much you talk about entering the field and entering the space and learning the people around but they don't then talk about at times when they moved back out again and it happens quite naturally i think people forget to, to talk through that process i spent times where i've been a very central part of a gym um training every session never missing a session maybe doing some coaching and then i've spent times when i've been a, a kind of a separate part to the gym and i've just gone in and i've just observed more and i've gone in and, and i've spoken to people at different times in, in different gyms where i've been nothing to do with the gym but they've known i've been a, in, been involved in boxing and the opposite i've gone in and i've i've spoken to people and i've got anything to do with boxing they treat me differently different positions in connection to the space that you're talking about can really help with this process of managing the idea that one inside a research is some sort of some sort of power that other research doesn't have but also managing those revealing and concealing elements by looking at gyms from the outer side you might see something a little bit different than when you go inside and then also while you're in there it's about understanding the balance the balance and the blend between that process um, there's a balance to be sought between being immersed and outside really really deeply in and being able to just pull yourself out again there's a balance there that's needed and a blend between the two that shifts and changes over time and that within that process is also borders and boundaries borders that maybe you can step over and you or you can't step over um boundaries that that keep things in different roles that you can play in different roles that you can't play and in this space it's okay for me to play this role i'm accepted in this way but somewhere else i have a different role if i have a different social role in that space people speak to me differently i can get different information from them they interact with me differently so we have to understand those different elements to it as well this is all how we try and manage and mitigate some of the some of the potential strengths and weaknesses sorry manage and mitigate the weaknesses try and enhance the strengths through this process as well now one of the things that i hear and i have actually fallen foul of this as well one of the things i hear a lot is um and it annoys me that I've fallen foul of it. I've only just realized that I have, but in the, one of those papers that I mentioned, I talk about the research process as being messy. Um, I've fundamentally shifted my mind from that recently. Uh, I've heard it quite a lot, and I fell into the trap of using it. It's not messy. I hate this idea that the research process is messy now. with no idea what it's writing. Why I think people think it's messy is because in comparison to um hard science uh, you know laboratory experiments there is a there is a, a, a clear um that there's a com clear comparison which means that this research is relatively less structured there is no um clear uh, consistent codification over the process of this research you know when i'm talking about it, i'm talking about balance and blends i'm talking about different positions over time i'm talking about something revealing something concealing these kind of this shifting um pulling and pushing elements to the process and if we call that messy that gets some people off the hook oh it was just a bit messy okay cool it was messy if we accept that um i think that becomes problematic um it's almost it, it's almost lazy it's a lazy way of talking about the process in fact, it's not almost lazy. It is lazy. When I did it, when I wrote that, I, I'm looking back now and I was lazy. I didn't think through what I was trying to say. I didn't, I just accepted this messiness. That, oh, research is messy. It's not messy. So what is it if it's not messy? Well, I think it's five things. Um, and these five things all work together. There may be more. I've not, full, I've not, I've, I've been thinking about this recently because I'm writing about it. I'm um, writing a book chapter at the moment my own book about immersive research um, and these ideas have been thrown around in my head so they may well develop further but five things it's not messy it is instead emergent systematic disciplined reflexive and coherent so i'll quickly go over those things so it's emergent what does that mean it means that we can have all the best intentions about what we're going to do when we're going to a research space i'm going to do interviews i'm going to do some observations but the research back shape the research process shapes what that looks like the research environment shapes the research process i should say so the correct method what i'm supposed to do when i go in there i can't know until i'm in there until i'm doing the work 
And then there is an element of um, accepting the path of least resistance with some of this stuff. Sometimes research gets handed to you on a plate. The, 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 the key um, gatekeeper lets you in. They introduce you to people. Brilliant. Okay, I'm on. Let's go. And sometimes it just doesn't work like that. And you meet four or five people. They all hate you and they don't let you into the space. It's happened to me as well. Um, so it's emergent in that you and the research area, <clears throat> the place, the people you're studying, the method that you're going to use will emerge from your interactions with those people. That's why I think people think it's messy because they're not able to write down what they were going to do, or at least if they were going to write it down, they knew they probably wouldn't follow it. So if we've got this emergent process, which some people call messy, now we have to make sure it's not messy. And that's where it becomes systematic. So we still put systems in place as far as we can to give this some, um, some control and some rigor to it. So I'm going to record this process. I'm going to record when I went, how I went. And did I go in the evenings to this place? Okay, if I always went in the evenings, what about the mornings? And I say it's systematic. If I didn't go and experience this place at different times. Did I get into a place where I thought, right, there's 10 people in this space. I really need to try and speak to all of them. That's the system. So we can put whatever the emergent process is, we can try and put systems in place to try and, to try and give some structure to that emergent process so we can make it systematic. Then it has to be disciplined. So once we have the system in place, we have to be disciplined at it. One of the things that's very easy to do, especially in this sort of research where you're relying on interactions with people, is to say, right, I've got these 10 people to speak to, or maybe it's 100 people, whatever, but one of them's really mean. <laughs> one of them scares me. I don't want to speak to that person. And I've had conversations with a PhD student who works with me who really, really didn't want to speak to somebody. And um, she had to because he was a very important person in that space. It's disciplined. We have to do it. And in the same way that some people get up and want, don't want to do their lab work on a, during their PhD or their process, and they still go do, uh, we still have to go do this. So it has to be disciplined. It gives that systematic element some rigor and we can keep working through it. It also has to be reflective. We have to be able to look at ourselves within this process. Am I getting too close? Have I not got close enough yet? Is my closeness meaning that I'm not able to speak to some other people? Have I switched off my critical faculties because I'm starting to like these people? Before I was investigating them because they were doing some, some potentially damaging behaviors that I was interested in. But now I, f I find that they're, they're all right. So have I switched off my, my reflexive capabilities a little bit? The way I do this is I've talked is through the um, critical examination of being nosy, um, uh, that paper. And I, and I explore the idea of how I, I was a white, heterosexual, able-bodied male in a space which was dominated by those men. I tell a story from that space, which is from the inside, which a lot of people can't necessarily get into, will find it harder to get into. That reflection helps me understand though that that story is a partial story, my story with them. So that's something to be really aware of. The reflection is an inherent element of this process. You know, we have to look at ourselves and where, where we are within it. And it's another way in which we make it less messy. Because by clearing that all up and explaining that and delineating it when we write about this as our methodology, someone is left thinking, oh, this isn't messy. This is clear. What this person's done is clear. And when these people are saying this stuff to this person, it's because of this process that they are having with that person. And people can probably imagine the sort of things that I get told would be different to the sort of things that other people get told. And that helps to clear some of that messiness up. And the final thing is it needs to be coherent. So it needs to make sense. There needs to be a coherence across the thing. The, the beginning point, this emergent element, needs to tie up with how you end this thing, how your research is produced, the findings that you draw out of it, how that ties back to the literature to fill in the, the gap in the literature that you found as to why you did the work in the first place. So there has to be a coherence across it. Now, if the research changes and shifts, okay, that, that coherence might change and shift, but you need to try and find that, this process of being able to pull things together. So that's why I, I kind of understand some of these initial thoughts in terms of um, immersive research. So with a video like this, I think it's important to be able to say, right, what do you do now if you're interested in this? And if you're one of my students or someone who's found this, who's studying this, or if you just have a general understanding, 
here's what you should do. And unfortunately, as I've said, there is no um, 10 top tips, although there could be 10 top tips actually, but they'll change for every situation. There's no coherent do this now, um, except for where I'm going to start, which is you have to start by going back to some of the basics, which is what I think. Um, an understanding of this sort of research, I think the best way to get it is instead of reading the new textbooks that are out, which will try and give you more of an understanding and do these things. I think that going back to books like this um, is invaluable. Um, Street Corner Society. There's a section at the back of this. It's one of the longest sections of the book. Starts at 279 and finishes 354. It's about his methodology. Um, and there's fantastic stories in it. The way that he writes about the space where he went and um, existed and the people he researched gives you an insider, is, it gives you an account of real insider research, which shows what you're aiming for. Once you know what you're aiming for, you can think, right, okay, that's how I might be able to go about doing that process. And the next one, Bloom is symbolic interaction. Isn't. First chapter on methods. It's cracking. It's really, really good text. He does fetishize insider research to some degree. So I have to be wary of that, but I think it's a very good start point. Um, that's where I always recommend people to go. Um, moving on from that, a couple of texts that I think are a little bit um, broader, experience in field work. And then one that takes a different angle um, and gives us some very good grounding in broad sociology as well. Beyond Goldsbloom, Sociology in the Balance. Um, my supervisor recommended this to me recently. Uh, it's an old book. Um, when is it? 77. But it was cracking. Um, really, really gave me a good understanding of why we're doing this and how it relates to the theory. Um, a lot of these texts give us that. They link it into the theory, which is where the coherence comes from. And then more recently, a couple from Howard Becker, which are cracking again. Um, evidence and tricks of the trade tricks of the trade is great in that it um, provides it's almost like he's talking to you as he talks to his phd students his postgraduate students and, and and one thing that i always find that people who have not had good supervisors i had a very good supervisor and people who don't have very good a very good supervisual uh, supervisory relationship or process lack some of these things and what what i got and what I find from a lot of people who really enjoyed the time with the supervisor or got a lot from the supervisor at least is that they're able to tell you a lot of detailed stories about this process which never come through in the writing so you might read their work you might read their books or papers but the stories that they can tell to help you understand it are usually lacking from them that book by Becker Tricks of the Trade has those stories in it so it's almost as you're reading it you can imagine him putting his arm around you and saying, right, let me tell you a story about this. And you'll understand it better. And then two more recent ones. Um, doing ethnography. Cracking chapter there in there by uh, Robert Proust in the beginning. And then a book by Proust, which I think is one of my favorite at the moment. And I've grabbed these, not because these are fundamentally the best, although I think the first two I think are essential, but because I'm just, they're on my, on my desk where I'm writing at the minute. And they are ones which I'm currently using and thinking about these ideas with from my own book. Okay. And that's all I wanted to say with this. What I'll probably do is I'll follow this up with some more um, specific elements. Um, that was a kind of general overview to get people thinking about what immersive research is, and I may be, end up doing some interviews with people as well um, about some of this stuff. Okay, hopefully that's been useful.